Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to join my colleague in congratulating both the member from Miku North in his new ministry, but also want to congratulate, I don't know if it's congratulate as yet or commiserate, with the member from Beaufort South as a new deputy speaker. Mr. Speaker, I become increasingly concerned when we come to the House and the House is either misled because there is a misunderstanding on the other side or deliberately misled, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly hope that it's not the latter because I think that it would be a sad state of affairs if we've gotten to, in this country, where a government in office believes that they can come to the House and mislead the House with impunity. And when I heard the member from Castries East, the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance's presentation this morning, I'm concerned, Mr. Speaker, that it's the latter. Because we have a press statement that came out from the World Bank. As far back as January, January 11th to be exact, Mr. Speaker, of 2024, <coughs> announcing that the World Bank's board had approved this policy-based loan for the government of Saint Lucia. And Mr. Speaker, it says the COVID-19 pandemic had significant impacts on Saint Lucia's economy, leading to a rise in public debt and poverty. In 2020, public debt had reached 94% of the country's gross domestic product, up from 62% in 2019. Despite recent efforts to implement careful financial policies and strengthen public administration, Saint Lucia still faces um, fiscal challenges. And, I go on to, and it goes on to say, Mr. Speaker, like many small island states, St. Lucia is also at risk of climate impacts, including a gradual change in rising sea levels and coastal erosion, as well as sudden events like hurricane floods and landslides. These events can be especially harmful to tourism and agriculture, significantly impacting its economy and finances. The country also faces obstacles to private sector growth, including limited access to credit, regulatory bottlenecks, insufficient public infrastructure, and high electricity costs. Now, Mr. Speaker, I come to the most important part because it seems that, I can't speak for him, but the member from Castries East, after giving such an elaborate detail, an accurate one, may I add, Mr. Speaker, of the conditions that were put in place for the CDB loan, where it became now obvious to all of us that the fact is that the government had actually agreed to implementing the 2.5% tax or levy, not for security and, and health, Mr. Speaker, as, as promoted, but in fact, it was to raise monies to support the loan that they got. And I see the member is now going in the opposite direction and seems to want to hold back on the real conditions. So the, the press statement says, Mr. Speaker, to help St. Lucia tackle these challenges, the project will have two main pillars. The first pillar supports St. Lucia's reforms towards fiscal sustainability, increasing revenue and transparency, and managing resources more efficiently. This includes assistance of the implementation of a new fiscal policies announced by the government, such as the introduction of a health and citizens security level levy and raising taxes on cigarettes. Here we go again. So some of the same conditions, Mr. Speaker, that we heard from the CDB loan actually are also applicable to this loan, which the, which, which the member from Castries East voided in saying. It went on, Mr. Speaker. So we now know that one of the conditions to this loan, Mr. Speaker, was the implementation of the levy and also other fiscal reforms, reforms, Mr. Speaker, of which the member from Cassarizis has yet to hallucinate us on, has left it again for us to, that's becoming the common word now with this government, Mr. Speaker, speculation. When they leave it to speculation, 
And when they leave it to speculation, then they turn around, Mr. Speaker, and want to accuse people of misinformation. If you don't want the misinformation to be out there in the first place, do not leave things to speculation, especially with your track record. It goes on, Mr. Speaker, and it says, Second pillar will support efforts in climate change and mitigation and adaptation by helping the government implement the National Energy Policy Climate Change Bill, which aims to speed up the shift in economy with lower carbon emissions by promoting use of renewable energy. Mr. Speaker, where does it speak about tourism enhancements and the other things the member spoke of? So is it that the minister did not know? Because we've heard that before. We've heard the minister make many annunciations of things that he did not know. And we would have assumed that he would have known given his track record in government. But this continual breach in the trust of the people of this country, Mr. Speaker, and this continual abuse of this parliament from members on the other side who have access to the information and ought to be providing us with an accurate account of what is transpiring, continues to run afoul, Mr. Speaker. We just had it. What the member said to introduce this bill and the assumptions behind the bill are far cry from what this press statement said. So I'm continued shocked, Mr. Member, Speaker. Member from Miku South, you keep making reference to a CDB press release, a World Bank. But this is we are, we are discussing a loan from the International Development Association. So, member, member, so I'm trying to make the connection between the World Bank statement and the motion we are debating. So I've given you some latitude, but you need to bring it back to the motion. Mr. Speaker, if in fact you've been giving me latitude, I greatly appreciate it. But the fact is, they're one and the same. The loan that we're here today is a World Bank loan. It's a drawdown on our SDR rights. This is the same, this is the press statement that came out, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry I don't have it in hard copy, but I'll be happy to make it a, a copy of, of the House. Right? That came out just before the announcement. So, Mr. Speaker, it's one and the same. There's nothing to be confused about. This is the World Bank loan. But remember, you began by speaking to the Castries East MP misleading the House in his opening statement. Yes, sir. But you have not spoken to that misleading aspect of But please. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm very, I'm very, very grateful if, in fact, I did not make myself clear. And so give me the latitude to re reiterate my position. The member from Castries East spoke about two pillars of this loan, Mr. Speaker. And neither of those pillars are the pillars that are referenced in this document, this press statement. So in fact, it would have appeared, and that's why I brought the CDB loan, that the same conditions that existed for the CDB loan are in fact the same conditions that existed for the World Bank loan. Now, how would I how would I even be able to pick that up? Because, Mr. Speaker, I was a, more, a former Minister of Finance. And when we negotiated with CDB, and we negotiated with the World Bank, and we negotiated with the IMF, they all speak. So the fact is, is that this loan is a continuation of the policy-based loan from CDB, and is the same policy-based loan from the World Bank. And what I'm speaking of is that the members stood there, Mr. Speaker, this morning, and misled this House in believing that the pillars and that this loan was going to be used for some tourism project, where it makes no reference to that, Mr. Speaker. In fact, it speaks to the same conditions that existed for the CDB loan. I'm glad that members on the opposite side think it's a laughing matter, because it seems to be a recurring decimal that this government believes that they have the authority to say and do whatever they want to do. And we don't want to appreciate that at the end of the day, they are accountable to the rule of law of this country. And you can run and hide, but you cannot, you cannot deny that that is a fact. 
This is a sacred house, Mr. Speaker. This is, the, this is the ultimate house of which we must all respect and come to this house and speak the truth. It cannot be just allegations of not speaking truth. And here it is, Mr. Speaker, that we sat here this morning and we heard the member from Castries East deliberately, I have to assume deliberately, Mr. Speaker, because I cannot imagine that a person in his position could have gotten it so wrong. How can it be that the World Bank in a press statement on January 11th clearly articulated what the conditions to the loans are. And that is not the same thing that the member spoke of. And then the member did exactly what he normally does, Mr. Speaker, and that's how I, I find myself running afoul. He never wants to speak to the details of anything and is always telling you either at the next meeting or one of his ministers are going to tell you. So here it is now that we're being told, Mr. Speaker, we're being told, Mr. Speaker, okay, that we have a budget process coming through and this is money that's going to be spent next year and we're going to hear details about it. You are coming to the House to seek the Parliament's approval to expend the money. You are expected to provide those details. It's not for the opposition to provide those details. It is for the opposition to hold the government accountable and to ask those tough questions. And I'm hoping that in his response, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Castries East will clarify. Now, Mr. Speaker, on another matter. Finally, Mr. Speaker, finally, something that has become habit in St. Lucia, that we obtain an Article 4 report. I don't know why this Article 4 report was delayed and only just came out. But I'm grateful that it has come out because, again, it speaks to some misconceptions that the member from Castries East spoke of, Mr. Speaker. The member from Castries East said that the debt, don't mind that we've borrowed over 700 million. Oh, he didn't use, I'm using the number 700 million in the last year and a half. That the debt to GDP is under control. 70% or less. That's what the member said, Mr. Speaker. Here it is, though. In the Article 4 report, it says, Paragraph 3, Mr. Speaker. Very happy to make this. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. There are several Article 4 consultations. I'm not too sure which specific one that the member is referring to specifically now. Which year are you referring to? I didn't hear you say it very well. 2023. It just came out. Well, normally it would come out, as you know, earlier in the year. Excuse me? No. You see, and again, I'm so happy that the member, the member from uh, Ancillary Canneries brought up these, because these are important things for the public to really know and appreciate. An Article 4 statement is an audit that is done by the IMF on an annual basis, Mr. Speaker. And the government can decide whether they want the IMF to publish the report or not. But yes. But I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that when a government does not allow the Article 4 report to be published, it actually generates substantially more questions and suspicion among people. So this Article 4 report was late in coming out, Mr. Speaker. But anyway, I'm happy. It's March 7th it came out. March 7th, 2024. And it says, <laughs> the member from Miku South to proceed with his contribution uninterrupted. <laughs> member of Castle Central. M Mr. Speaker, whilst um, we take your advice in good stead, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes you listen, and, and you know, when you permit members, you give members the latitude for the leader of the opposition to stand, to stand in this August chamber and to assert that government can prevent the IMF from publishing a report. It's not only erroneous, you know. And by your rising a point of order. Well, that's the point of order. He's misleading not only the House, the population of this country. How can you say that government can stop IMF from publishing a report when IMF has its own website and you can go there and print whatever you want? I mean, that is ridiculous. 
coming from a, 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 an ex-prime minister. You have made your point. The, the adjectives are not necessary. I know they are not, but sometimes you really have to pound them if the head is hard, Mr. Not, Speaker. Not in this house. Sorry. And for the record, the only person who gives latitude is the presiding officer. I don't give attitudes, Mr. Speaker. No, I latitude. Oh, gla oh, latitude. Oh, latitude. latitude. Well, the presiding officer, not other members. Member of Amigo South, objection has been taken to your statement that a government can in fact prevent the IMF from printing an Article 4 report. Would you care to comment on that before you proceed? Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm very uh, aware of the Minister's inexperience in governance and certainly um, that he is absolutely wrong. In fact, it is absolutely correct, Mr. Speaker, that the IMF Article 4 report is always published at the consent of the state. If the state disagrees with the report, Mr. Speaker, the state can ask the, the uh, uh, IMF not to publish the report, Mr. Speaker. So let me proceed, Mr. Speaker. This is published on March 7th, Mr. Speaker. It says, on current policies, public debt is projected to stabilize around 75% of GDP in the medium term, significantly above the regional ceiling of 60% of GDP of 2035. Bank credit to the private sector is projected to remain anemic in the absence of improved loan loss provision, um, fiscal adjustment, and additional legislative reform. Natural disasters are a recurrent threat, risk to outlook and title to the downward, and includes global economic slowdown. So, Mr. Speaker, here, here is a dilemma that all countries face, Mr. Speaker. The fundamentals of, of economic management of a state. There are fundamentally three things a Minister of Finance, among others, but three primary things that the Minister of Finance must be focused on. One, Mr. Speaker, is that his economic growth rate remains higher than the growth rate of debt. Okay, so when, when, when your debt rises faster than what your economic growth rate is, ultimately that is going to lead you now to a problem. Meaning you're gonna to get to a problem where you're actually going to be having more debt than you have revenue, okay? The second thing is, and it's not a new phenomenon, but it's current in, to, in the context of today, Mr. Speaker, and that's inflation. So when your economic growth rate is below your, 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 your debt growth and below your inflationary rate, these indicate that you are heading in the wrong track. And if you allow those things to persist, we're going to find ourselves in a position where the only thing that the government can depend upon is getting policy-based loans in order to be able to resolve the issues. So Mr. Speaker, it is very clear that we can see by layman terms that this government has now made it a habit to borrow. Every time we come to the house, it's a new set of borrowing. We've seen that they have, in less than one year, borrowed more money than we had to borrow for the pandemic. And there's no pandemic. In fact, this government boasts about, and I want to use the word very carefully, Mr. Speaker, very carefully, the recovery. Because as we speak now, Mr. Speaker, there really has been no growth. What we've had is a recovery. When your GDP contracted by 24%, you only have one way to go, that's up. You all have not gotten back, not from a tourism perspective, not from an economic perspective, back to where we were in 2019. And in fact, when you take into consideration inflation, Mr. Speaker, we're slightly less. So we have not even fully recovered. You can't even begin to talk about growth yet. And it's obvious, Mr. Speaker, by listening to the members on the opposite side and looking at the policies that are coming out and the level of borrowing, we're in trouble, Mr. Speaker. So when you take HIA Airport, Mr. Speaker, who is going to pay for the cost overruns? St. Jude's, who is going to pay for the cost overruns? Millennium Highway and West Coast Road, who is going to pay for those cost overruns? The Rodney Bay Road, the member of housing and his complete 
utter irresponsible act with, as it pertains to the shock and tavern housing developments. Who is going to pay for those inefficiencies? When we give away land in St. Lucia at under the market price, Mr. Speaker, when we give away, when we give away $400 million of revenue and we get very little in return, where is the investment going to, that's going to take place, Mr. Speaker, to improve the capacity? Instead, we see that this government apparently intent on simply generating easy money. The easy money, Mr. Speaker, is to tax people, taking money from people's pockets. So when the members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, want to boast that the, they've collected already $10 million and they're going to collect $44 million, where does that money come from, Mr. Speaker? That money comes from people's pockets. That's less money for people to spend. And now what you're saying to those people is that you have to trust the government that they're going to spend that money more efficiently than you. And we can't even see where the money's going. This is the same government that said you can't eat roads. Where's the economic? This is the same government that said that foreign direct investment must demonize. We don't want white people in our country. And today now, they have to now take a reverse track because they've now recognized that those words are coming back to haunt them. And the same things that they criticized the former government on in wanting to grow the economy and to balancing our, 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 our accounts, meaning we wanted to make sure the economy was always growing faster than the debt. We want to make sure now that we control inflation. It is, it is a disaster, Mr. Speaker. It's a calamity, Mr. Speaker, when a government would have not addressed the inflationary problems in this country and would have uh, deliberately adopted policies to allow bus fares. And now I hear persons wanting to make a comparison. Can you imagine, Mr. Speaker? I want to make a comparison between bear and water. I want to increase the price of water. They want to increase the price of water. In this environment that we're in right now, Mr. Speaker, after bus fares have gone up, electricity has gone up, bread has gone up, food prices throughout this country have gone up, and the, gov and the government now is taking even more money away from the people by taxing them. So, Mr. Speaker, the, prime min the, min min the member from Castries East presentation... The, 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 the member from Castries East presentation, Mr. Speaker, okay, brings more questions, and I'm concerned, Mr. Speaker, of this continual habit of misleading this House, and where a government is to provide actual information, that there seems to be a deliberate attempt to suppress that information. We are here to approve this bill, and I do not believe, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Castries East in his presentation has provided this House with all of the information and to the conditions of this law that are necessary to get the support of the opposition. And I dare say that hopefully the public who is listening to this, who have already seen that the government breached their trust by telling them to make sacrifices for the um, tax on health and safety to find out that that money was never intended for that use. That money was intended to get support for both the CDB loan and the World Bank loan. And that is, that is what is taking place in this country. And I'm even more concerned, and I'm saying I'm looking forward to the estimates and the appropriations bill, to see the numbers because we've been left in the dark, Mr. Speaker. I see that even the IMF, Mr. Speaker, even the IMF on the report, showed unemployment blank. Even they have concerns, must have concerns with the formula that the government is using because they've left it blank. The IMF, and that's as of March 7th. So don't try to make it out to believe that the opposition is playing politics. We're simply asking the questions and providing the information. And I think that we are deserving of the accurate answer of what's taking place, and not the BAPWI. Why is it the IMF has not put the, 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 uh, the unemployment numbers? See, that's a typical thing, Mr. Speaker. Ask the IMF. Really? They're, they're here, they're here representing the people of St. Lucia. 
You are accountable to the people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. Not about Mapui, about calling people names. It's simply asking that the information that's provided to this house is accurate. And that to give the public of this country the satisfaction, Mr. Speaker, that the affairs of this government, are be, are, of the people, of the country, are being run fairly, justly, and that we can trust the information that we're obtaining. And I would say to you, Mr. Speaker, there is time for this government to correct their ways and to make sure that when they come to this house, that they bring accurate information. And if it is uncomfortable, it is to explain to the people why you have to make those decisions. You're not accounting to me, Mr. Speaker. That's not, that's not, I only represent the thousands of people in opposition. And my office continues to offer a platform to all of those people, Mr. Speaker, who have concerns. And therefore, I'm bringing their voices to the table. And I'm saying to this government, we all have to make difficult decisions. Don't be scared of them. Come out and tell the people the truth. But when you come to this house, Mr. Speaker, with half truths, or in, in fact, sometimes no truth at all, it starts causing people to reconsider the trust that they've put into you, in, into this government. And it will destroy the democracy that we have, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm concerned that the member did not articulate the conditions to this loan. I am concerned that the member has not articulated how this money is going to be spent. Is there a deficit that we don't know about as to why you now have to borrow money for budgetary support? All the indications up until last week, Mr. Speaker, they, all the indications were unemployment was down at its lowest level, economic growth was booming, okay, revenue is doing well. So why would you have to go and borrow $100 million on budgetary support? I don't understand. And there are another bill that we're going to pass today in which we can ask even greater questions. But my concern, Mr. Speaker, is the amount of borrowing $200 million from the Saudis, $100 million from CDB, another $100 million from um, uh, World Bank. We're now going to go and guarantee another $80 million. We have several other loans, over $750 million in borrowing, Mr. Speaker. How can this government say that things are going well? They're acting like if they're drunken sailors, Mr. Speaker, on a spending spree. So they're doing one thing, Mr. Speaker, and their actions and their words are saying something entirely different. And I'm asking the, the member from Castries, please, when he comes to this house, provide the accurate information to what we're doing. Because today he did not do that, and I'm disappointed that he didn't. I'm sure there are a lot more people, Mr. Speaker, who are disappointed in that. Thank you.